Hello everybody and welcome to our March edition of our monthly lecture series. My name is Charlotte, I work at Brighton and Sussex Medical School in our outreach team. My main role is going out to schools and colleges and chatting to anyone who's interested in studying medicine. Um, and this evening we're very excited to welcome Dr Eleanor Jayawant with us. Um, Dr Eleanor Jayawant joined BSMS um, as a research fellow in 2021 after finishing her PhD in chemistry at the University of Warwick. At BSMS, she uses computer modelling and lab experiments to understand how blood cancers um, develop and how we might be able to better treat them. Outside the lab, she is a keen advocate for underrepresented groups in STEM and is a big board game lover. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over for this evening's talk. If you have any questions, please do use the Q&A function. Um, and if they're appropriate, I will respond um, during the talk. If not, we will wait for Eleanor and we'll get to them at the end. But I hope you enjoy it. Um, and thank you again for joining. Eleanor, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about my experiences um, as an autistic cancer researcher. I am a research fellow at BSMS. So what I mean by a research fellow is I'm a scientist who does research into um, cancer in my case. Um, so I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I do scientific research title of my talk is Navigating Cancer Research on the Spectrum, Unpacking the Molecular Diversity of Cancer Through the Lens of Neurodiversity. Um, so I've kind of divided this talk into two chunks, um, where at the start I'm going to talk about um, my experiences as an autistic person in science and how, I, how I've navigated um, how I've navigated that. And then the second section is about my experience in cancer research, um, what, it, what it is that I actually do, and I'll show you some of the, my data that I've got from my own research at the end. So to start with, oh, this is very important that I state this, I am not a medical doctor, my PhD is in chemistry, I'm a researcher, I'm not a psychologist, um, I am not speaking on behalf of all autistic or neurodivergent people, this is all just based on my own experiences. I've done a bit of reading in the background, um, but I am not an expert in this apart from through lived experience. So I wanted to start by giving you a quick summary of my career so far. Um, so. Over the last 10 years, I have been um, expanding my career in science. So I started off with my bachelor's degree in biochemistry at the University of Man Manchester. And during my bachelor's degree, I did a placement year at MRC Human Nutrition Research in Cambridge. And it was during this time that I realised I loved working in research and that's what I wanted to do moving forward. I then decided to pursue a master's degree and I did um, a master's course in genetic manipulation and molecular cell biology at the University of Sussex. And this is where I hit my first stumbling block in my career. Um, my mental health was very poor during this time and I decided to take a temporary withdrawal. So I did a two year course, uh, sorry, a one year course over two years. I took a year gap in between semester one and semester two. After my uh, master's, I wasn't deterred. I knew I wanted to work in research and to do that, I wanted to pursue a PhD. So I moved up to the University of Warwick where I did my PhD in chemistry. And it was around this time that I started to question whether I could be neurodivergent in some way. One of my friends had recently been diagnosed as autistic and this really challenged a lot of assumptions I had about autistic people and there were lots of things that she described that really resonated with me and I thought wow but but I do that so I started to wonder um I'm sure I don't need to go over what happened in 2020 everyone's work was interrupted I was lucky enough to be uh, in my final year of my PhD at this time but for me this really reinforced that actually yes my brain did work a little bit differently to most other people. There were lots of changes that I just couldn't cope with in the same way that others could. And luckily I was in a position at the time that I was able to pursue um, a diagnosis privately. And in October of 2020, I was diagnosed as autistic. And this led to a lot of what I like to call light bulb moments, which um, I'll talk about a bit on the next slide. After finishing my um, my PhD 
in uh, spring of 2021, I began as a postdoc at Brighton and Sussex Medical School, um, and that's where I am today. So that's a brief history of the last 10 years of my career. So those light bulb moments that I mentioned, um, if anyone has had a diagnosis um, of being um, neurodivergent, I, I'm sure this might be a familiar uh, concept to you, that there are suddenly lots of things that click and make sense. So you think, oh, hang on, it's not normal to uh, rehearse every single conversation you've ever had, collect all the things. This is a photograph of my rubber duck collection that I had as a teenager. Um, line up your toys for hours on end as a child, have a bit of a mental breakdown because an aisle at the supermarket's been rearranged, cry at sports day because people are cheering too loudly, count Christmas lights and keep track of how many you count each year, find it hard to speak if something upsetting has happened, be able to hyper-focus on something one day and then the next day your brain just doesn't work at all. Because all those things are totally normal to me. So um, this is a stupid meme that I made when I got my diagnosis, because it actually really sums up how I felt. I had gone through my whole adult life collecting various mental health, um, mental illness diagnoses, and none of them really fit. And actually, when I got my diagnosis of autism, it was, wait, it's all autism? Yes, of course, it always has been. It just encompassed all of these things. Um, so hence the, the stupid meme. So when I list all these traits, it seems quite obvious, but you might be thinking that that doesn't necessarily match up with um, the way that I present myself. I, I might not fit your expectations of what an autistic person looks like or behaves like. Um, and this is because um, I am very good at masking or camouflaging my difficulties. Um, and this is very common in girls and women, but it does also occur in, in boys and men as well. Um, and this is one reason that there may be such a disparity between um, boys and girls being diagnosed with autism. It might not necessarily be that um, women and girls have less are, are, are less likely to have autism. It might be that maybe we're just a bit better at hiding it. Um, but I'm not going to talk much more about that because, as I said before, I'm I'm not a psychologist. This is not my area of expertise. But you might be wondering, why does it matter? OK, so I'm autistic. So what? Who cares? Well, the reason that I think it matters is because around one in seven of us are neurodivergent in some form. And it's. Firstly, it's not ethical to discriminate against that huge, uh, against anyone, let alone a huge proportion of the population. Um, additionally, there have been studies that suggest that um, diversity is actually good for science. It's not just that it's fair, it's that it's better. We, we can produce better research if we have people from all sorts of backgrounds. And this totally makes sense to me. If you have people who are, all have had the same life experiences, they're not gonna be coming up with lots of different ideas in the same way that people who have had lots of come from lots of different backgrounds and have had lots of different experiences do. And um, this is a cartoon that I really like. I think it's just quite cute because it just highlights some of the great things about diversity. We love diversity because you can learn cool things. You can open up your mind to new ideas, expand your knowledge, figure out new ways to express yourself, meet new friends, all of these things. So this is why I think it matters that I'm telling you that I'm autistic. And um, my advice, which I fully accept this is much easier said than done, is let's celebrate our differences. So I've been lucky enough that I feel comfortable to do that at BSMS and I hope that if you come to BSMS you'll feel comfortable to do that too. So I'm now going to switch direction completely and talk about my work in cancer research. So I wanted to start by telling you why how I ended up at, at BSMS and I find it helpful sometimes to think about science as 
a spectrum and we can be uh, we can be very computational or we can be very um, experimental, very like wet lab based. And most of my work before my PhD was very experimental. Um, I was doing uh, all sorts of experimental techniques during my, my bachelor's and my placement year and my master's. Of course, I was using computers to help me understand, to do my data processing, to do analysis. But I was in the lab every day doing microscopy and, and doing um, cutting up little bits of mice and all, all of these things. Um, and then when I came to do my PhD, I switched directions um, and I, my PhD was in computational chemistry and biophysics. And it was during this time that I learned to code and I was running simulations. And these things were suddenly the coolest thing in the world to me. You can, you can use a computer to just, you can just write a piece of code and it will just do what you want it to. And that's mind blowing to me. And I found it hugely exciting. I, I love the lab work. I love the excitement of learning a new technique when you get a result that is what you were expecting. But I also realized that I loved the satisfaction of writing code and having it produce an output that's really useful and really interesting. So I decided after my PhD, I wanted to be smack bang in the middle. I love the lab work and I love the computational work. So I wanted to be doing both. And I was lucky enough to um, find a position at BSMS that is 50-50 lab work and uh, computational work. The other reason that cancer research at BSMS is very exciting to me is because there's so many different groups of people that I can work with. So I'm a scientist. I'm a postdoc. I'm in this bubble over here. I work with lots of other scientists, so principal investigators and students from undergrad, uh, masters, PhD students. I also get to work with doctors. Some of those doctors are also students that I get to work with. So um, some doctors go on to do a PhD after their um, initial medicine school, med school uh, training, and um, then they do some time uh, working in research. But we also work with um, radiographers who will uh, scan patients, hematologists who are experts in blood disorders. We also uh, collaborate with nurses who will take patient samples for us. Of course, the patients themselves give up their samples very generously. And we also get to interact with them through um, patient outreach days where we get to find out their experiences. We also get to work with charities um, who also thankfully give us some money sometimes um, and other funders as well. And the reason this is so important is because, in my opinion, the best science is multidisciplinary and collaborative. So this comes back to what I was saying in the first part, where if you've got lots of different groups of people, you're going to be getting lots of new ideas. So I think this is hugely exciting. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk you through my research through the sort of funnel where I'm going to start very broad. I'm going to talk a little bit about cancer. Then I'm going to narrow down into blood cancer. Then I'm going to talk about diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is a specific type of cancer. Then I'm going to talk about NF kappa B, which is a molecule that's very important in cancer. And then I'm going to show you some data from my research. So the third reason that I find cancer a very compelling topic is because I want my research to help people. I want to feel like I'm making a difference in the world. And when you look at the statistics that one in two people in the UK born after 1960 will be diagnosed with some form of cancer during their lifetime, you can see that there's clearly a huge unmet clinical need to understand and treat cancers better. We just, there's a, there's a huge amount of progress happening, of course, but we're still not there yet. That it's so cancer still has a huge impact on our society. And if I can feel like I'm making a tiny bit of difference, then that's what I want in my life. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about cancer in general, we have these what we call hallmarks of cancer, where a cancer cell is able to resist cell death. Um, it's able to um 
keep proliferating when it shouldn't be, even when the signals are telling it not to. Um, it's able to evade growth suppressors. It's able to metastasize. It's able to keep going, keep dividing forever, even when it shouldn't be. And it's able to induce angiogenesis. So this means it's able to um, sort of hijack some uh, some a blood supply to feed it, essentially. And when we have all of these, we end up with cancer. Um, blood cancers specifically are what I am working on. So just to tell you a little bit about the cells that you have in your blood, in case you're not familiar, we have our red blood cells, which are these um, sort of disc shaped cells here. And then we also have our white blood cells, which are made up of different types, such as neutrophils and lymphocytes and monocytes and basophils. And these are all involved in our immune system. And blood cancers can take a few different forms. So um, in leukemia, we have our normal, healthy white blood cells in our in our blood. And maybe one of them has gotten a mutation and it started dividing when it shouldn't. And instead of it dying it just doesn't, and it keeps going, keeps going. And then we end up with leukemia. Lymphoma is a similar thing, but it happens in our lymph nodes. So for example, in our, in our neck, um, a white blood cell will have a mutation and it will divide uncontrollably and turn into cancer. And then myeloma is another type of blood cancer, but this is affecting our plasma cells, where again, it will have a mutation, something will go wrong, um, and we end up with multiple myeloma. And I'm working on lymphoma, so I'm going to be talking more about lymphoma moving forward. Um, so I know that a lot of you are interested in going to med school, um, so I thought I'd throw in a slide showing what, what lymphoma symptoms uh, people often present with. Um, it's a huge variety of things that can could be caused by, by many, many other illnesses. Um, Things ranging from night sweats uh, are particularly horrible in um, in lymphoma, weight loss, loss of appetite, fever, muscle weakness, joint tenderness and pain, um, lymph nodes being enlarged, shortness of breath and so on. So there's lots and lots of different symptoms. Um, and of course, a patient who presents with um, pain or tenderness in their joints might not have lymphoma. Uh, it could be any number of other things, but sometimes if that patient's really unlucky, then it is. Um, so I'm working specifically on a type of blood cancer, a type of lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL as I'll refer to it. It's a very common type of lymphoma and it's very interesting to research because it's extremely heterogeneous. So this word heterogeneous, what I mean by this is you'll have two patients who have the same cancer. They've had a diagnosis of DLBCL. It's in the same place. It's been their lymph node. Um, but if you look at the molecular makeup of that cancer, if you look at the mutations inside the cells, they're very, very different from one another, even though it's both, both patients have DLBCL. There's been lots and lots of different attempts to classify DRBCL based on some of this heterogeneity. And there's lots of different subtypes with different prognoses. So this is a, a very complicated looking heat map. But what we basically have here is patients kind of along the bottom. And then along the side, we have lots of different mutations. So if there's a colored in blob, it means a patient has that mutation. And even though there are lots of clusters. So for example, uh, in this paper, they've got five different clusters um, of um, DLBCL patients. And there are similarities between those clusters. But if you look at a specific patient, uh, this patient might have a mutation here, but then the patient, uh, this patient doesn't, for example. So there's all of these different subtypes, all of this different heterogeneity and each of these patients will have a slightly different prognosis. But despite this, everyone gets a one size fits all treatment approach. Um, there's no differences in treatment for DLBCL. And it's just not a good enough treatment. Only uh, around one in three DLBCL patients will not survive five years after diagnosis. 
So our current treatment that we get or, or that we, we uh, would give to uh, DLBCL patients is um, an immunochemotherapy regime called RCHOP. Um, so CHOP is uh, three chemotherapy drugs and a steroid prednisolone. And CHOP's been used for, for many, many years now. And you can see that it's reasonably effective. So this uh, chart here shows a percentage of patients who, who survive versus overall survival in years. And this dark black line moving down is as the patients sadly die. Rituximab is um, an antibody that targets um, a marker that's expressed on B cells. So B cells are a type of white blood cell that are um, the, the ones that are causing the cancer in this case. Um, and so this rituximab is a way of targeting this chemotherapy to, um, to the B cells, the ones that are causing the problem. And you can see that actually, if we add in rituximab, suddenly the prognosis is much better. So this light gray line is much higher up than the black one. So our CHOP has, uh, so the rituximab was added to the CHOP regime uh, in the early 2000s. So this hasn't actually changed in over 15 years. And if we arbitrarily look at this five year point, we can follow this line up and we can see that, yes, only somewhere around 60 percent of patients are going to be surviving. Um, for five years. I think this graph is a couple of years old now, so the numbers might be slightly better, but this clearly isn't good enough. And it's not as if we're not progressing in the field. There's been lots and lots of research going on um, throughout the years whilst RCHOP has been in use and the therapy isn't changing. There's been lots and lots of clinical trials adding in different drugs to try and improve um, the outcomes for patients, but our chop still is as good as we've got. So some of the research that's happened while we've had our chop is we've learned a lot about um, different subtypes of DLBCL. We've learned a lot about NF-kappa B, which I'm going to talk a lot more about in a minute. We've learned about mutations that are particularly important in DLBCL. We've learned about double hit, which is a a very, very nasty type of um, DLBCL where patients have two specific mutations that um, are very, very poor, result in a very, very poor prognosis. And we've learned more recently about these very complicated subsets where maybe it's not just these two that we thought we had, maybe we have five or seven or, or whatever. But the therapies aren't changing. And we think that actually the challenge is getting the right drugs into the right patients. This one size fits all approach clearly isn't working. We need a more tailored approach. So for me, I think that the million dollar question is, can we use personalized medicine to better treat DLBCL patients? So without personalized medicine, which is what we kind of have at the moment with our CHOP, we have a pool of patients and we give them all one drug. Some of them will be cured. Some of them won't be, and some of them might even have really nasty side effects. With a personalized medicine approach, we can do something to try and sort of work out what the drugs, the most appropriate drug is for a patient. And then we can give them tailored drugs and everyone is, or more, more people are more appropriately cured. So I said that we've learned a lot about NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B is a protein complex, and it's hugely important. It's found in almost all um, animal cell, uh, in, in all, almost all animal cell types. Um, and it plays very important roles in your body's normal response to inflammation and infection. So whenever you're infected with uh, a virus or a pathogen of some kind, NF-kappa B is going to be doing things to regulate your response to this. So it's really important. We, we need it. But there's lots of mutations that can cause things to go a bit wrong. Um, and if you look at some of these uh, things that NF-kappa B can do, if I bring back those hallmarks of cancer, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of overlap here. So uh, NF-kappa B can promote tumor cell survival, which is going to be helping uh, resist cell death. It helps with tumor cell proliferation. We needed that uh, sustained proliferative signaling. 
It's going to help with therapy resistance and immunosuppression, which is going to help evade growth suppressors. It has roles in invasion and metastasis, which again is important for cancer. It can promote cancer stem cell growth, which allows cancer cells to replicate immortally. And it can promote angiogenesis, allowing the cancer to essentially hijack a blood supply to feed itself. So you can see, hopefully, that NF-kappa B is really quite important for cancer research. And here are um, some types of blood cancers where um, NF-kappa B is overactivated. We know it's, it's switched on when it shouldn't be, and this um, causes us a lot of problems in these cancers. But there's lots of others that I haven't listed here, and it's not just blood cancers that NF-kappa B is important for. So I've told you that NF-kappa B is really important in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We know this from lots and lots of research. But NF-kappa B isn't one molecule. NF-kappa B is any one of five different molecules that can form 15 potential dimers. We know a little bit about some of these dimers and which ones are important. So for example, this one, CREL, we know that that's important in one subtype of DLBCL. A recent paper came out that shows that RELB is perhaps important in some subtypes of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. But there's a lot more that we don't understand here. And there's a lot more that we need to do. The other thing that adds a little bit of complexity um, when we're trying to understand NF-kappa B in cancer cells is that cancer cells in a patient are not going to be behaving the same way as cancer cells in a dish, if you take them out and put them in, in a dish in the lab. Because in a patient, they are surrounded by lots of other different cells healthy cells. So um, cells that are important in your normal immune system, um, for example, T cells, uh, macrophages, these are all um, white blood cells that are just normal healthy immune cells, but they form what we call a tumor microenvironment where the cancer cells are interacting with these normal cells. They're responding to stimuli from these cells. So just to give you a quick summary of why DLBCL is so complicated, We've got the interpatient heterogeneity, where we've got lots of different patients with lots of different mutations. We've got the complexity of NF-kappa B, where we have 15 potential different dimers, and we know it does all of these different things. And we've got potentially got to think about differences in the microenvironment too. So hopefully you're starting to see that this is a very complicated problem. So, you might be thinking, OK, so NF-kappa B is upregulated in cancer. Why don't we just get a drug to knock it out or inhibit it? But you hopefully will remember that I said NF-kappa B is very important for our normal immune cell functions. Um, it's in almost all cells. So if we just knock it out, that's toxic. But what if we could target a specific subunit? We don't have to knock out the whole lot. Maybe if we just knock out rel -A for a patient who has very high rel -A. that could work. The other thing that makes it more difficult is that NF-kappa B signaling is really, really complicated. So we've not just got those 15 different dimers. We've got these two signaling pathways, and this is a very simplified form of that of the signaling pathways in reality it looks a little bit more like this where we have lots and lots of different arrows we've got all those different dimers um, the two pathways interact with each other um, there's lots of feedback loops and it gets it's just really hard to understand so we in our lab believe we need systems biology for this so you might not be familiar with the term systems biology um, and i really like the way that harvard medical school um, their systems biology institute describes it it's using the tools of mathematics and computation because biology is too complicated for the unaided human brain and i think of um systems biology sort of as a cycle it's a very cyclical process um, you'll 
generate a hypothesis from a uh, uh, from a simulation that you've run. You've got a prediction. You can go into the lab. You can test that prediction that might answer a question or maybe bring up a new question. And then you can feed that into your simulation a bit more and then maybe come up with a new hypothesis and then test that and so on. So we sort of go around this cycle of biology, technology, computation and so on. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how these models work. So obviously I've said that we, we use computational models and we use these models to, stim to simulate cellular processes and make predictions about the events in cancer development. And the way that a model is made is we'll take some literature, we'll do some reading, we'll um, find experiments that other people have done and published about, or maybe even find models that people have published. Um, we'll do some maths, uh, and these are all in the form of ordinary differential equations, which uh, might look a little bit familiar if you've done maths A-level, but don't worry, I'm not going to talk much about these at all. And then we write some code to run a simulation, and we use a language called Julia for this. And we think that this approach can help us understand signaling in blood cancers. So I promise I'm not going to talk much about the maths at all. Just this one slide, I promise. Um, so you can think about if you take this um, one family member of nf kappa B, P52, this is originally uh, a much bigger protein called P100, and it's chopped up by um, an enzyme, so a molecular machine that chops it into P52. We can write that out like this, where we have uh, P100, which is our substrate, NIC, which is our enzyme. We can form an enzyme substrate complex, and then we can have our product, P52, and our enzyme. And we can write that out like this, where we can calculate the rate of P1, uh, the, the concentration, sorry, of P100 over time based on the binding of this complex, this P100 NIC, and the unbinding of that complex. So this direction where we have P100 NIC going to the two separate species. So these, these equations themselves are not that complicated. Um, but we have so many in our system because each arrow in our network is an equation that it very, very quickly becomes impossible for a human to, to solve all of them. So um, we have to rely on computers. And one way to think about the model is kind of like a weather forecast, right? These are all, uh, weather forecasts are, are made using models. Um, so this is the weather forecast from our beautiful sunny Brighton yesterday. Um, and we can use our model to forecast several things. So we can think about how a normal healthy B cell behaves. We can think about which changes we can make to the model and see what has the biggest impact. So if we tweak a number slightly and it has a massive impact, then that number is really important. Whereas if we change it slightly and nothing happens, maybe it's less important. We can think about how mutations might affect abundances of nf kappa B subunits, which is really important for cancer because obviously mutations are often what causes cancer. And we can think about how a DLBCL cell might respond to a stimuli as it would um, in its tumor microenvironment. But in order to do all those things, we need some data to feed in to start with. And ideally, it needs to be data that is single cell. So um, in biology, there's lots of different techniques we can use. Um, we can get information about a population of cells, or we can get information about individual cells in a population. For this, we need data on the individual cells. So this is where I go back into the lab. Um, so I'm using a technique called flow cytometry. And this is a really, really cool technique, actually, where um, you take your cells, so this might be from a, a blood sample or um, from cells that you've been growing in the lab, and you stain them um, using an antibody. So you're probably familiar with antibodies um, in terms of a viral infection, but we can actually also engineer antibodies to help us in the lab where they will, they will um, bind specifically to a protein that we're interested in, and only that protein in theory. Um, and we can also um, 
tag them with special dyes that will fluoresce if we shine a laser at them. So in flow cytometry, there's this big machine and you feed your cell sample in and they get into a single file and have lots of different lasers sh shining at them. And they will reflect light based on their size and their cell complexity. And they'll also fluoresce based on these special dyes that we've tagged them with. Um, so if a protein has, uh, if a cell has lots of, a pro uh, for example, this triangular protein uh, with this green dye on it, it will fluoresce where we shine the right wavelength on it. And um, we'll be able to measure that using a detector. And we get plots that look a bit like this, where we have uh, each of these dots on this plot is a single cell. Um, and I, I think that's super neat. Um, the thing I don't like about flow cytometry is that you get so much data, which is, is good, but it's also a bit of a curse because it becomes very, very difficult to compare all your data, if in particular, like between patients. Um, I should note that flow cytometry is also used in hospitals diagnostically. So if you're interested in, uh, in coming, going to med school, um, this might be a technique that you, you'll use one day. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can present your flow cytometry data. You can present it like histograms. You can present it like scatter plots. You can present it like bar charts, maybe even fold changes. And I don't know about you, but I just found that very overwhelming. And I thought, no, this is not this is not how I want to spend my life staring at lots of histograms and trying to work out which one's more and which one's less and no so we came up with this way of um of allowing us to compare different cell populations whilst maintaining all that heterogeneity between all the single cells so we standardize all our data to a special type of statistical distribution called a Z distribution, which is where um, the mean of the data is uh, zero and the standard deviation is one. And then we plot these as a contour plot and we call these NF kappa B fingerprints. And here is um, some of my fingerprints that I've generated. So um, this is uh, rel A, which is one of the um, NF kappa B family members, and this is rel B, which is another one. And these are arbitrary units, so don't worry about the, the scale being negative. It's just this is low, this is high. Um, and this little orange blob down here is um, some healthy cells that I've taken from somebody's uh, volunteer's blood, and I've processed, and I've done flow cytometry. And what I see is these healthy cells are very low in rel A and rel B. And then all these other ones, which are much higher in rel A and rel B, are all different types of DLBCL. So this one in the dark orange is from a patient who very kindly donated a lymph node biopsy for research. And I've isolated their cells and done flow cytometry. And that we can see that they have much more um, rel A and a bit more rel B than the healthy, um, the healthy cells. And then these other four blobs are all um, DLBCL cells that I've been growing up in the lab. So these once they, they originally came from a patient, but I've been maintaining them and growing them and they're, they've been made immortal. So uh, they'll keep growing forever. Um, and these have very, very high levels of um, NF kappa B. So this was really neat. And we were really excited about this, that we could actually generate a unique fingerprint for every different um, DLBCL case. And so here's that same experimental data I just showed you. And we can also use a computational model um, to generate that data as well. So here, uh, here's the experiment and here is the fingerprints that we have generated using a model. So the color scheme is exactly the same where these are the healthy, this is the patient. And then these are the four um, DLBCL cell lines that I've been growing in the lab. And this is a pretty good match. We're really excited about this, that we can, we can use our model to generate fingerprints based on some data that we can input saying, okay, this one's got low, low relay, this one's got higher relay, and we can make these nice fingerprints. Um, this is some work that was done by um, Aaron Pack, who is a PhD student in, um, in the group I work in. And he's done some very nice modeling work where he's been looking at um, rel AP50. So that's 
where rel a is bound to p50 which is this one here and he has measured um the the levels of rel a p50 at a steady state so what this means is when the cells are not receiving any stimulation they're just sitting in a dish essentially but in a computer um and what aaron predicted was that the um the reavers would have uh, so the dark blue has very low levels of rel ap50 the green has lots the orange has a little bit less and then the light blue has a little bit less again and he also is able to predict how these cells respond so um here they're responding to a tlr9 agonist so this is um a a molecule that binds to a receptor on the surface of um, a b cell and this activates the nf kappa b signaling uh, so that's why i put this big uh, lightning bolt here and his prediction is that uh, the dark blue responds the most and the other three don't really respond that much and i was able to test these predictions in the lab so here's a lab experiment i did where um i saw that the dark blue uh, reavers did not have that much um, rel a in their nucleus the um the green ones had the most then the orange and then the blue and if we compare that to aaron's prediction that fits really nicely we see the exact same trend and then aaron's prediction based on how these cells would respond to um their nf kappa b signaling being switched on I was able to test this in the lab as well. And what I saw was that the dark blue cells responded the most, and then the other three didn't really respond that much at all. So this was really cool that we could um, we could use this model to make a prediction and then we could test it and get similar results. So this was really exciting. So back to that million dollar question that I proposed earlier in the talk. If we can work out if a particular subunit is important, can we selectively inhibit that subunit to help the patient? Well, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think we might be honing in on what we can do to try and um, work out what a patient needs. We like to think that maybe we can use these nf b fingerprints one day to determine if a patient uh, will be most responsive to a REL-A inhibitor or a REL-B inhibitor, for example. Um, so maybe the future looks a bit like this, where we've got all this uh, DLBCL research happening, and then in the future, we're working towards um, a personalised medicine approach. So um, I think I'm pretty much uh, ready to finish, so I'll just um, sum up what I've talked about. So current treatments of DLBCL are not good enough. Only 60% uh, of patients will survive for five years after diagnosis. nf b is really important in blood cancers uh, as, and also other cancers, but I'm interested in blood cancers. Um, it's very hard to understand nf b signaling without computers to help us. Um, we need systems biology for this. Our experiments have shown that every DLBCL patient has a unique nf b fingerprint and we can use our model to um, recapitulate those fingerprints. Um, our simulations show that we can predict changes in nf b in response to stimuli, and we can test those in the lab and get a really good match. And we're working towards a future in which different patients could receive different um, drugs based on their nf b fingerprints. We think personalized medicine is the way forward. A um, few final thoughts. Here's some nice pictures of Brighton in case you've never been. Um, science and research are really hard, but hopefully rewarding. Hopefully one day my work will help people with blood cancer. Being neurodivergent can be really hard, although I don't know what it's like to not be. So I don't know. Um, differences in perspectives are necessary in science. Find people who appreciate the different perspective that you bring to your work, whatever that is. I've been lucky enough to find such people at the SMS. Um, I hope that when you come to med school, you'll find those people too. These are all of the people who have helped me with this work. Um, so uh, my supervisor, Simon, um, and Andrew and Chris have um, helped me a lot with my, my lab work. Um, the rest of Mitchell and Pepper teams, uh, John Jones um, helps us out with patient samples uh, from Eastbourne Hospital. And I am funded by um, UKRI.
and thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm now happy to take some questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, I learned an incredible amount. Um, so it was really it was really great to hear your experiences and I guess to hear about the progressions in computer modeling and, and where we might be able to work <clears throat> with technology to kind of hopefully bring about this personalized medicine approach. Um, I found it really interesting. So I hope everybody else did. We have got some um questions in the QA. Um, I don't know, I don't know if you can see them or whether you'd like me mm -hmm. to read them out. Yep, I, I can um I can answer them. So um, the first one I can see is how common is DLBCL as a cancer? So that's a great question. So it is the most common type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So um, lymphoma is divided into two categories, non-Hodgkin and Hodgkin. Um, and it is uh, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, I believe, is the fifth most type of can fifth most common type of cancer in the UK and DLBCL makes up a significant chunk of this i think it affects oh i want to say i think it affects about five thousand people in the year in the uk per year but don't quote me on that because i might have made that up um I, ha I had the statistics in a previous version of this uh talk but i took it out um so it's it's not as common as things like breast cancer but it's it is a significant burden for the NHS um, and it's a very very interesting cancer because the treatments just haven't progressed um, so it's it's not the most common type of cancer but it is it is actually up there um, despite the fact that lots of people haven't heard of it so yeah um, the next question I can see is how effective are embryonic stem cells in cancer treatments? Would pluripotent stem cells be just as effective? That is a great question. And I do not know the answer to that question. Um, so I do not do anything with um, stem cell therapies. I am not the correct person to, um, to ask, but I can find out and send an email to you if that is something you'd be interested in. Um, but that is not my area of research, I'm afraid. Um, do you think, anticipate that there'll be an adequate amount of funding for personalized DLBCL treatments in the future? That's a great question. Um, I hope so. Um, there's a lot of clinical trials happening and it's very frustrating to me as a, as a researcher because there's currently quite a big um, divide between um the clinicians and the scientists in DLBCL whereas where the cl the clinicians who are running the clinical trials don't ever separate out based on subtype in their clinical trial so they never see an improvement in the treatments and all the scientists are going do it based on do it based on subtype come on come on there might be a difference and it just doesn't happen so i went to a big um blood cancer conference last year and the first few talks in the DLBCL session were um, scientists saying yes it's really important all these subtypes are very very important we have to think about these and then all of the clinical trials for the rest of the session were just yeah we didn't we didn't separate out at all so there's a huge amount of funding in DLBCL it's just not currently going to the right places perhaps um I think I think we're getting there this more recent research with um there's been a lot of big studies quite recently showing that there's uh, so, for example, there was that heat map that I showed at the beginning um, with all the different mutations that showed that there were five different clusters. And then there was another study that followed up that identified, I think it was seven. And there was a lot of overlap between a lot of the clusters. So there are definitely groups that are working on this and that are interested in this. There's just a, st still a little bit of a divide. It's not quite making its way into the clinic yet. Um, I hope so, is the, the short answer. Um, thank you. Um, what does the time frame for one of your typical research projects look like? What are the different stages involved leading up to a publication? That's a great question. So um, my so I'm I'm a postdoc, so I'm on a temporary contract. And um, my research project has funding for four years with the possibility to extend for a further three, depending on my output. Um, and during that time, I would hope to produce uh, a handful of papers. 
Um, I'm currently uh, gearing up to publish one very soon. Um, but science is, I think my instinct with science is that, I mean, you can go forever, right? You can research forever, but you have to stop at some point and you have to write it up at some point. Um, so at the end of my four year contract, my project will start wrapping up, but obviously I won't have solved cancer. Um, but in terms of the different research stages leading up to a publication, it's very much um, you do an experiment to kind of get, kick, get, kick off, get started, and um, you might find an interesting result. And then you might pursue that interesting result a little bit. And then you think, oh, hang on there's something here. So you might write out a list of bullet points that could maybe one day be a paper. And then you think, oh, how do I make that bullet point a bit more fleshed out? Okay, well, I'll try doing this experiment. Um, and then you get more and more of an outline building up. And then you kind of try and tell a story with a paper. So you look for gaps in your story. Oh, what, what data am I missing in order to make this story, in order to tell this story nicely? What data do I need to make it so that the person who reads this paper understands the way that I did this, the way that it makes sense. Okay, well, I'll do that experiment then. So you kind of, it's very much an iterative process. You start from a very small thing, you get an interesting result, and then suddenly that gives you, that leads way to lots more um, experiments that you do. And then those get fleshed out and fleshed out and fleshed out until eventually you end up with a draft of a paper that you send off to, uh, lots of other people to help you read it and write it. Um, yeah, so uh, it's it's a very slow process. It takes. Um, so I, I've been in my current job for almost two years, and I'm just now about to submit my first paper from my project. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Do you think current advancements in mRNA technology could significantly impact DLBCR research? That's a good question. I haven't really thought about that much. I, I assume you're talking about like mRNA vaccines that we've been seeing a lot of um, in the new world that we live in. Um, I I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think it's something that I should think about, but I mean, I think it it's had a big impact in a lot of um, fields. I wouldn't say that DLBCL research has directly felt that impact compared to virology, for example. Um, but I think it's certainly something that we should be being mindful of. Um, we, we've certainly not seen an impact so far, is what I would say. What other ways can personalised medicine be used in cancer research? Um, the most exciting example I can think of the, the most sort of ultimate form of personalized medicine is um, a therapy that you might have heard of if you um, are very interested in, in this field. Um, it's been in the news a little bit um, where sometimes if normal chemotherapy doesn't work for patients, there's this very fascinating technique called CAR T therapy, which is where um, T cells, which are a type of white blood cell, are taken out of a, a patient and they're engineered in such a way that they then, when they're reintroduced into the body, will find and fight the cancer cells. So it's a way of, it's like I said, it's the ultimate form of personalized medicine in that you're taking something out of a patient, modifying it, and then putting it back in specifically for that one patient to help them. And it's had some really astounding results. I mean, it's, it's not a perfect treatment at all, which is why we don't use it as a frontline therapy, but um, it's had some really fantastic results so far. So I think there's lots of different ways that we can use personalized medicine. For some cancers, the drugs that we have that are used as frontline drugs are for the most part very, very good. And I think personalized medicine is less of a priority for certain cancers. Where heterogeneity is a big deal in a cancer, I think personalized medicine is more important. So I think, I think it's mindful to, uh, I think it's important to be mindful that um, 
we shouldn't just charge necessarily always towards personalized medicine if the current treatment we have is is good then we shouldn't we don't need to fix what's not broken essentially um i hope that sort of answered your question um were there people who tried to bring you down because you were neurodivergent how do you overcome it that's a good question um i think it's that's a little bit hard for me to answer because I didn't know I was neurodivergent for most of my life. I only found out a couple of years ago. Um, for most of my life, I was just like that weird girl, um, uh, that weird anxious girl in the corner who is like talking about Sonic the Hedgehog or whatever. Um, so I think... Uh, so the way that I got through my teenage years in particular is I just did my best to be invisible. I, I, so I, I think that's not a very happy existence, but one positive of that is that you tend to not make enemies that much. People tend to not bring you down. Um, I'm not saying that that's the way that you should be if you're neuro neurodivergent to avoid conflict. Um, but moving forward once I understood that I was neuro neurodivergent I've tried really hard to make it be a positive force in my life the day that I got my diagnosis was a day of celebration for me because suddenly I understood why I'd felt different my entire life why I'd always been that weird girl in the corner um and I know I I, I know that this is so much easier for me to say than for people to do and not everyone is in a position where it's safe for them to to be as open as I am but my advice is really to to be proud of who you are and if people are trying to bring you down they're not your, they're not worth your time they're losers not you um so try and try and be proud of who you are you can't change the way that your brain works by being ashamed of it so you might as well embrace it um anyway like i said i'm i'm fully aware that that is much much easier for me to say than to do in practice um and i think i think it's something that as or at least i found in my life as i've gotten older i've gotten more confident in myself um so maybe this is a skill that will come to you in time um yeah, I, I I don't know what other advice I can give, um, but I hope that was somewhat helpful. Okay. Uh, was it difficult for you to learn how to code and shift your brain into the world of computer science? Um, less so than I expected. I've always been very interested in computers. I've always sort of dabbled in um, kind of that sort of thing. Um, I once tried to teach myself C++ as a summer project for fun. I didn't get very far, but I, that sort of thing's always very, really appealed to me. Um, so I didn't find it that difficult. I think, I think the thing that helped is I'm a very stubborn person. And once I realized that I could write a piece of code to do something for me, even if doing that thing would take me five minutes and it would take me an hour to write that script, you better believe I was writing that script. So, um, so I, I think the best way of learning to code is by writing code. It doesn't matter what you're writing. If you have a problem that you want to fix and you think, Oh, I bet I could write a piece of code to do that. Just try. Like there's so many resources on the internet. I think my first piece of code was I wanted to take, um, column A of a file, column B of a file, smush them together and then output that new file. And, I could have done that in Excel. I could have just copy pasted one one column, copy pasted the other, saved it. But I was like, no, I reckon I can write a piece of code to do this. And yeah, here I am three years later. Um, yeah. Amazing. Um, I think we'll just wrap up with maybe one final question. And I've had a look and this one kind of um, is maybe a good one to end on. But considering your experiences in academia and life in general, what advice would you give to your 16 year old self? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think my advice to my 16 year old self would be chin up. It gets better. Um, being a teenager is terrible. 
Um, <laughs> I think, or at least I, I found it to be terrible. Um, I would say work hard, but take time for yourself. Don't feel guilty about resting. It's okay to rest. It's okay to look after yourself. Um, I'd say you got this. Yeah. I think that's a really fitting place to, to press pause on um, the monthly lecture. So thank you very much, Eleanor. Um, it was thank a really you. interesting, insightful lecture. But I hope you have a lovely rest of your afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you very much. Um, you've been great. And we will hopefully see you again soon at another online event. Um, but thank you very much. And we'll see you very soon.